Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. At hundreds of locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash bluewire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. Your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Sunday night, June 9th, 2024, as we bring you a new episode. The Chicago White Sox wrapped up their series against the Boston Red Sox this weekend. And they set a new franchise worst losing streak as they lost on Thursday night to extend it to 14 games. But then the White Sox won back-to-back games on Friday and Saturday and quite frankly should have won on Sunday to clinch the series. Tanner Banks couldn't close out the ninth inning when Michael Kopech was not available and the White Sox continue to be awful in extra innings as they lost 6-4 to on Sunday. There's two in-game decisions by manager Pedro Grafal that are a bit puzzling from Sunday's contest. One, Grafal continues to stick with Martin Maldonado late in games with runners in scoring position. The two big situations were bottom of the sixth inning with the bases loaded at two outs, then in the bottom of the eighth inning with Lenin Sosa on third base to help extend the White Sox lead, Grafal stuck with Maldonado who, of course, struck out. Grafal maintains that Maldonado's defensive value is worth keeping him in tight games. And that, that comes up every time, you know, Maldonado, Maldonado plays. And, you know, and I, and I understand it 100%. Um, we're in a 3-3 ball game in the sixth inning. Um, there's a reason why Mal, Maldonado catches. Um, and there's a reason I give Corey, you know, days off too. Um, Corey had run a, had run a stretch of, I think, about 10 or 11 games in a row. And uh, Maldonado uh, does a really good job behind the plate. And, you know, still in the sixth inning, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to pinch it right there um, I, I think he's really valuable behind the plate but I understand you know I, I get it um, you know he's not he's not swinging it um, it's a it's a hot topic every time he catches uh, it's going to continue to be a hot top hot topic and uh, I'm going to continue to make decisions that I you know that I feel uh, is best for the team not just offensively you know defensively as well so um, you know the bottom line is we took a, a 4-3 nothing you know I mean a 4-3 lead into the into the ninth, and yeah, we could have extended it there. Um, you know, but I like what he does behind the plate, and I you know I like I like him in these type of in these type of games in these type of situations. As a catcher, you believe in Martin Maldonado, even though he is hitting what he's hitting. I believe in his defensive value, right? He's not swinging the bat, you know, obviously offensively, but um, I believe in what he does defensively and what he brings to the table for us, and how he navigates pitchers through you know through games that you know that are that are tough you know and um it's unquantifiable that's the problem right that you can't you can't quantify that um you know but i've been around the game long enough that i know what he does behind the plate and i know how he prepares and, and i know what he brings to the table so i'm not going to sit here and harp every single time on every time maldonado pitches why do i pinch it for him in the first inning if, or the second inning if, he's, if his at bat comes in I, I'm, I'm you know um if the game's on the line you know uh late in the game and you know or or even, you know, if I feel like, you know, this is the time to do it, I'm going to do it. I've done it before. 
before and I'll continue to do it, but um, I'm not going to just go through this every single, you know, every single day. Um, whatever the bat is, the second, third inning, fourth inning, um, I believe in what he does defensively. The second issue is Pedro Grafal loves himself some Duke Ellis. And boy, does Ellis have one major league skill. There are some good news from this weekend. Gavin Sheets is on a roll and Paul DeYoung may get to 20 home runs before getting traded. Oh, and Drew Thorpe, the headliner prospect from the Dylan Cease trade, is making his Major League debut this upcoming week. So let's get started. Joining me is Sox Machine's managing editor, Jim Margulis. And hello, Jim. The White Sox split, which is good, especially after losing 14 consecutive games. But maybe they should have won this series against Boston as Pedro Grafal's decision-making comes under fire once again. Seems like it. I was uh, a little bit removed from it, at least the uh, second half of the series, going to uh, the Knoxville area to watch the Birmingham Barons, kind of like my my own treat uh, to myself of being able to uh, you know, watch better baseball or more uh, talented, cohesive team. But having followed the coverage, especially let you behind the scenes here for the listeners i was driving home during the game and when i pulled in uh i looked at our text chain uh with you and james and the first thing i see was uh bag or win expectancy chart from James and just asking about the that's uh, you know when we have the uh, White Sox losses uh, graphics designed by uh, Billy OK uh, normally the win expectancy chart is a an ordinary loss and the bag is for especially uh, gruesome or embarrassing fan murdering type losses and so I, I looked at that uh, text I thought like oh this could be good and turned out it was a, more of an ordinary loss but it's ordinary because yeah it, it's Pedro Griffol not being able to readily replace or uh, admit at a veteran is underperforming beyond even uh, the, the White Sox lowest standards. All Griffol really had to say, and again, we played his quotes during the intro, defending his decisions, not just for Sunday, but all the time, and maybe even in the future, as Lotus Griffol continues to be the manager of the Chicago White Sox, which we'll get into that in a moment. But we'll continue to maintain that Maldonado deserves the playing time because of the one skill that you cannot measure. But what we can measure, Martin Maldonado has got an OPS of 235. Not his batting average, not his on-base percentage, not even his sluggy percentage. His OPS is 235. And he is going to challenge some records of the worst hitter that has ever played the game of Major League Baseball, like single season. He's going to challenge that, maybe even surpass that. BaseballReference.com is now measuring that and tracking that with their social media campaign. So that's pretty embarrassing, especially for Martin Maldonado. But for Grafal, all he had to say on Sunday was, guys, listen, Corey Lee is taxed. Unfortunately, he was not available. This happens on Sundays. We didn't have Lee. We didn't have Michael Kopech. We didn't have Jordan Leisure. So it was really up to Martin to come through for us. And unfortunately, he didn't in those two opportunities. And I think everybody that covers baseball would have been like, yep, okay, understand. You have those moments during a 162-game season. Lee's been playing a lot as of late, whether either catching or DHing. But no. Pedro has decided that Martin Martin Maldonado needs my defense. Out of all the players that I will not throw under the bus or publicly defend, I'm going to choose the worst players on my team all the time. The guys that are constantly underperforming and being extremely detrimental to our ability to win games, those are the guys, Jim, I am going to defend and die on that hill. And it's Martin Maldonado, it is Andrew Benatendi, and it doesn't make sense to me. I am the man who will fight for your honor. That's <laughs> it. It reminds me a little bit when it comes to catching and uh, being readily apparent that he's just, he doesn't have it anymore. Uh, Carlton Fisk. Back in 1993, his last year, he was hitting 189, 228, 245, uh, 473 OPS, OPS plus 29. 45 years old at the time. Also, he had given up, 
He had 22 stolen bases in 24 attempts. So League was running wild on him, especially for that time. Uh, just did a lot of stolen bases on him. And I remember the Angels, I think it was Buck Rogers, who was the manager at the time, talking about like, yeah, we're going to run wild on him. He's, you know, if he can't do it, he can't do it. But we're, you know, this is uh, Major League Baseball. Uh, we're not pulling any punches because of uh, a guy who's a Hall of Famer behind the plate. Like he has to be able to throw us. If he, uh, if he can't throw us out, we're going to run. And... Shortly after he set the record for catching the most games, the White Sox gave him a motorcycle and then uh, released him. And Fisk wasn't happy about that and you know, caused bad blood for years. But it was a case of the White Sox saying, like, you know, Ron Karkovice is and, and whoever we have behind Ron Karkovice is better than Carlton Fisk as much as he's done. Just because this is really untenable on both sides of the ball. Looking at Maldonado. Yeah, like you said, it just the, the average is plummeting. Uh, and also uh, behind the plate, he's allowed uh, 24 stolen bases in 26 attempts. So he's not r cutting guys down the base paths. Uh, the framing numbers are bad. The uh, production is abysmal. Uh, and it's like he's not a major leaguer anymore. The tough part is like, I'm sure Griffol has some allegiance to him because of the time they overlapped, maybe some catcher code or something like that to where, you know, Griffol feels very obliged to protect Maldonado, but Maldonado just got here with the White Sox. Like White Sox fans have no reason to feel any kind of connection to him like they did with Carlton Fisk. Fisk did so much for the White Sox. And yeah, of course, the White Sox fans are going to get mad or feel like they did him dirty when they cut him loose. Whereas this, like what has Maldonado ever done for White Sox? fans. I don't get why Griffol is like that. He was like this Andrew Benintendi saying uh, that Benintendi, you know, two months is not enough to bench him. And then it turns out that he's been playing uh, Hertz for two months, uh, according to Benintendi. So like when he gets in these uh, modes where he has to protect somebody who is not doing, who's not meeting the standards for Major League Baseball on the field, there's no possible way for him to win. And yet he does it because he just has these hangups. For a guy that supposedly may not be managing for his job, which we'll get into those notes from Bob Nightingale of USA Today, because clearly he talked to Jerry Reinsdorf and Tony La Russa again for his notebook section from Sunday's paper. But for Pedro Grafal, like you're managing a 17 and 49 win team. The winning percentage is 258. You are staring down and on pace to be the worst team that's ever played Major League Baseball since 1900. You got to be managing better than this. Again, it's it's incredibly frustrating, and it just brings the question, what is the point of Pedro Grafal? Which is a great segue to what Bob Nightingale wrote Quote, the Chicago White Sox have no immediate plans to dismiss manager Pedro Grafal, refusing to solely blame him for being baseball's worst team. The White Sox believe it would make no sense to bring in and pay another manager when the team's fate isn't going to change no matter who's in the dugout. Grafal is in the second year of a three-year contract for about $3 million. The White Sox are expected to reassess this winter to determine whether a managerial change is needed. End quote. This has become such corporate America running this baseball franchise that if we never point the finger and blame anyone, well, then no one's to blame Jim for being the worst team in Major League Baseball and a complete embarrassment to the sport. You can't blame anyone because we're not going to blame anyone. Corporate America. Yeah, it was very much like a Rick Hahn type move when he was in charge to cast a very wide net when the team was struggling, especially around deadline activity or lack thereof. He would say, well, you know, it's on everybody. It's on me. It's on Kenny. It's on Jeremy Haber. It's on, you know, Ricky Renteria or who is, who's in charge. Like we're, we're bringing the players and talk to them about what we need. We're talking to Ron Kittle. We're talking to Southpaw. Just he would go on and on about all the, uh, all the cooks in the kitchen. And while, you know, maybe he was trying to dole out credit or say it's more than me. It's also like a case where if you just bring so many people into it, why bother getting mad at just one? Why getting mad at why bother getting mad at Rick if you know Kenny is the one who's actually in charge? Why bother getting mad at Kenny if you real they realize that like Jerry Reinsdorf is limiting what he can do? And it just it becomes very you feel very helpless as a customer, being like I you know none of my rage can be directed anywhere because nobody's ever going to be accountable. And you know last year, uh, 
yeah, the White Sox actually finally made Han and Williams accountable. But then he goes to Chris Getz, and it was funny, like reading that Nightingale uh, paragraph where he says the White Sox believe it would make no sense to bring in and pay another manager when the team's fate isn't going to change. And I just picture that very clearly in Jerry Reinsdorf's voice, like when he says makes no sense, like uh, he's got that um, that tone of voice similar to when he hired Chris Getz and said like, why bother bringing anybody else? Uh, we don't have a year. Take a year. Branch Rickey could come out of the grave. It would take him a year. Like it's just this uh, argument th that he makes that you could very easily counter by saying it would make some sense, but in Reinsdorf's worldview, just like it would make no sense. It, it's open and shut. Uh, there's no way to argue him out of it. He's just going to sound uh, befuddled by your confusion that anybody could look at it in a different way than he does. Awesome. Why do anything? Why even bother playing the games, Jerry? Just forfeit. Just forfeit the rest of the season. Just do everyone a favor. We could go watch the other 29 teams in Major League Baseball. Simulate everyone could end. get a break. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just why bother, Jerry? Maybe the next time Bob speaks to him. Uh, the LaRusa part, if you do read the column from Bob Nightingale in USA Today, talks about the unlikeliness of trading Luis Robert Jr., in which the White Sox would want to return more than what San Diego got for Juan Soto. I should say what Washington got for Juan Soto, uh, which Washington got uh, C.J. Abrams in that trade and Mackenzie Gore. So that would be quite a bit the White Sox would want in return for Luis Robert. And the unlikelihood of Garrett Crochet, which totally undermines whatever text conversations or phone calls Chris Getz is having. So there's no way that Getz would share that type of information to Bob Nightingale. So, yes, Jerry Reinsdorf at Tone of the Russa, making lives so much better for Chicago White Sox fans. Thank I saw you. Reinsdorf in uh, Knox, or I saw La Russa in uh, Knoxville, by the way. He was there. So, why? I don't know. Second time I've made a double A trip, and he's been there. Cool. All right. Maybe he's following you, Jim. Maybe he knows your calendar. He's just tagging along. Uh, you know, he did manage Knoxville uh, before he uh, was elevated to the White Sox uh, in the 70s, I, th I think. So, you know, perhaps there's some uh, reunion, but probably not. If I <laughs> if it was a one off thing. Sure. Yeah. Maybe he just felt like dropping in on some old friends or maybe the, the team invited him down for something. But yeah, having. Uh, now I think it's two of my last four trips to Birmingham or, or to watch Birmingham and he's been watching them too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, moving on from Maldonado and Reinsdorf and La Russa, there is some good that happened over the weekend. Again, the White Sox won back to back games, uh, in pretty convincing fashion, actually on Friday and Saturday against Boston. And, and a large part of that is that the offense seems to be picking it up here for the White Sox. They scored plenty of runs at Wrigley. They just couldn't close out those games. Uh, and they also had multiple run leads against the Milwaukee Brewers in their series sweep that they got last weekend. But Gavin Sheets and Paul DeYoung are on a roll. And Gavin Sheets in his last seven games is batting 308 with a 379 on base percentage, but he's slugging 538. And that's the important number. Friday, he had a big home run for the White Sox. Saturday, he had a grand slam that completely blew up, blew open the game for the White Sox. He went three for four in that game. And then on Sunday, when the White Sox blew another multi-run lead and the game was tied three to three, it was Gavin Sheets against a left-handed reliever that came through with a single to left field at the time to give the White Sox a four to three lead, which we talked about why the White Sox could not extend that lead nor could hold that lead. And they failed to win the series. But Jim, like with Gavin Sheets, and we always look ahead to when guys are healthy, and we've learned by now that whenever somebody's healthy, somebody else gets hurt. So Gavin Sheets is still going to get plate appearances. Where, if it's playing time in right field or at first base at DH, depends on who's healthy and who's on the roster. But we had this conversation, along with our friends from the 108, when I was in the stands over the weekend watching the games. And I feel like moving forward for the White Sox, if they do want to like suddenly change their mind and they want to be good again, I feel like you could count on Gavin Sheets more than Andrew Vaughn at this moment. And there's just a part of me that's like, man, just put Gavin Sheets at first base because Vaughn's not getting better. And in the next two years, if you're wondering who is going to help hold down that corner of the infield and help anchor the lineup, 
I've got more confidence that Gavit Sheets could be a league average better hitter, which he is right now, than Andrew Vaughn. So that's kind of like my feeling. My feelings are changing with Sheets. Like before this season, why is Sheets even on the 26-man roster? Here we are on June 9th, and I'm thinking if playing time becomes a crunch because guys get healthy and the White Sox can stay healthy, I'd rather have Gavit Sheets at first base than Andrew Vaughn. I think the one uh, difference between the two is that Sheets needs a caddy. Uh, so you need somebody who can face left. He's getting better at facing lefties. And I think uh, Griffol is, is playing him more to see like how much he can do. But historically, hasn't faced many lefties, doesn't play well against them. So you need a plan for if you're giving first base to him that you also have a right-handed first baseman of some kind. Whereas Vaughn, you can play him every day and you get the results you get, but you know, his, his splits have been uh, inconsistent enough to where you feel like he's okay against righties. Cause sometimes lefties are the problem, but yeah, it's funny with sheets. Yeah, aside from the fact that like he's built like a tank and doesn't get hurt. And so like, that's the reason why he's gotten so much playing time, uh, whether in right field or DH or first base, uh, he's always available when somebody else goes down. The other reason I thought that he's gets playing time or why you know managers have like playing him is that in situations where it feels like a run should score he's pretty good at those situations like in his career bases loaded career 406 hitter runners on second and third career 471 hitter runner on third less than two outs career 462 hitter all situations where he's probably facing a righty, or at least most cases he is. Like if a lefty comes in, he's being pinch hit for. So, you know, there is the uh, probability that his numbers are being goosed a little bit. The batting eye is good. He's got enough loft in his swing to where he doesn't hit too many double plays. And when he's up in the plate in those situations facing righty, you feel pretty good about it. And so I think managers, uh, w- with so much uncertainty on this White Sox roster and so many un yeah, habitual underperformers and cheats has been one at times. Uh, I think there's some comfort there in seeing him come plate and feeling like, okay, you yeah, know, he should probably do the job of getting a run home. Uh, yeah, that was his first career grand slam. So he's not like Robin Ventura with the bases loaded, but he's at least, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you can trust his batting eye to deliver pretty good results or pretty good decision-making at the plate in those situations. So I think you're seeing that now where uh, he's doing that, but also uh, the problem is that production has been fleeting. And then, you know, you get two weeks of uh, s- some real thump and then it's followed by a month of, pretty quiet production some walks some singles but the the power goes away and so that's what i'm guarding myself against mentally in terms of like putting too many eggs in this basket but you can't deny he's doing pretty well and when he's doing pretty well i think it's more satisfying than most because he also draws walks and avoids double plays so it's like a pretty well-rounded uh at least in terms of like plate approach uh it's a well-rounded hot streak when he gets on one I mean, for the season, Sheets is hitting 246 with a 349 on base percentage and slugging 436. Honestly, I would like to see the slugging percentage be higher. But it is nice to see someone of the White Sox with an on base percentage creeping up to 350. But he's got a season OPS now of 785 thanks to his hot streak. Andrew Vaughn hitting 217, 276 on base percentage, slugging 350. So his OPS is 626 after 60 games. Vaughn's season is, like, ruined. I don't know. I mean, he's going to have to be Sammy Sosa over the next 60 games back in 1998 uh, to correct his season. Maybe he could do it. I'm very doubtful of that. And I guess to revisit a previous conversation, maybe Paul Dion does get to 20 home runs, Jim, before he gets traded. Possibly. Yeah, it's... uh... (laughs) I keep thinking, like, with his uh, penchant for swinging and missing, uh, especially, like, in the zone, um, it's a very fine line he walks with, like, producing. And as uh, Toronto and San Francisco learned last year, um, offering very little at the plate. So I keep thinking, like, oh, this is his hot streak. And certainly that big drop-off is around the corner that uh, brings him down to being a below-average bat who can play a, a decent shortstop. And... Nope, not yet. At least he's uh, he's he's raging against his profile, and yeah, I mean, like every homer he hits uh, between now and 
he, you know, he talked about being dealt in August, I think, uh, on, on one of the uh, uh, weekend baseball shows. And uh, if the way he's playing, like he would be a July trade candidate at this point. He wouldn't be a waiver claim. Uh, a team would give up something in order to get a, a shortstop who's on pace for uh, uh, 25 homers. Like you would take that. So, yeah. Good for him. Good for the White Sox. Uh, it is the one move I think in this uh, play fast model, and you know, for for Griffel and also like in Getz's, uh we want to find defense and guys who are you know willing to uh, step up their games and one year contracts because they feel maybe like a little bit desperate. Like he's the guy answering the bell. Like Nicky Lopez, you know, he I think showed his worth to the Braves last year in terms of like being a utility infielder, everyday second baseman. Too much for him. Uh, so I think DeYoung is the one guy who is really carrying that uh, that vision of somebody has some baseball to give and the White Sox are the team that can uh, give them the playing time to uh, to get that hot streak and get that uh, that that whether it's a rebound bounce back or or dead cats bounce uh, he, he's getting that in his last 30 games 104 at bats Paul Dion has nine home runs 20 RBIs he's not walking I mean he's hitting 260 with a 313 on base percentage but Dion is slugging 558. And his last seven games, Dion's sluggy percentage is 846. For a team that's so thirsty and so desperate for more thump in the lineup with more power, Paul Dion's been delivering. So I would recommend Grafal to pair Sheets and Dion right now since you do this whole I'm going to build a lineup with the hot hands and continue batting Nicky Lopez. Like, oh, why is Pedro Grafal the manager? Mm hmm. <sighs> but with Sheets and Dion hot, the White Sox need that. And as we saw over the weekend, when they put the ball over the fence, they're going to give themselves a chance to win. And this losing streak would have not been 14 games if the bullpen had pitched better for the White Sox, but it happened, and that's a new franchise worst. But if you're looking for some positivity, some optimism, the offense has been hitting. Real quick... Bring this back to earth. Another bad. Jim, when is the Duke Ellis experience over? Because he's got one major league skill. He runs fast. That's it. I've seen him make really bad defensive plays. He has no throwing arm. He mm -hmm. has no confidence at the plate. I don't have any confidence that he's above a 30 grade contact or power bat at all. And he could he could run fast. I mean, that's his one major league skill. And Pedro Grafal continues out of all players on the team. Corey Jokes. Corey Jokes can't play nine innings anymore, despite him playing a decent left field and being one of the best hitters for the White Sox. No, I got to pull him in the seventh inning because I feel like Duke Ellis can make an impact. <sighs> I, for mm -hmm. my sanity, I need Pedro Grafal to go away. So, Jim, when is the Duke, <laughs> when is the Duke Ellis experience over? Yeah, I missed the... Uh you know, one of Griffol's classic maneuvers, which is to defensive sub too early and then have that player hit for himself. I've always wanted that player to have like a different colored jersey, like a defensive sub come in wearing like a fluorescent <laughs> green or fluorescent orange jersey. Like a soccer goalie. <laughs> yeah. And when he comes to the play bat for himself, it just kind of signals to everybody this shouldn't be happening. Like man either manager jumped the gun or bullpen failed. Something wrong happened to where he's hitting for himself. And yeah, the, the jokes thing is confusing. Just just because you know he looks right now in terms of plate approach, in terms of corner play. I mean, we've seen so much bad corner play that I'm not sure why Jolks is the one doing it. Like we, you know, Colas is in the other outfield spot, and Colas is playing nine innings, uh, even though he you know messed up plenty last year and, and was in Griffol's doghouse for doing so. Zach Deloach doesn't seem like he, you know he's been bad in a corner and he's been defensively replaced. So Ben and does not get defensively replaced. Uh, and you know, we're seeing jokes and we're seeing Deloach do it. And Ellis, I'm not sure if it's bringing back Terrence score flashbacks to like the Royals days and feeling like, Oh, this is our, uh, this is our victory cigar right now. When he's in the game, that means they're locking down a win and nope. He's not that good of a player. Like 
I think in Birmingham, you know, Jacob Burke is, gets the bulk of the reps in center field because Burke is a very good defender. Uh, Ellis is not, or at least he, I, I think he's better than he's shown in the majors. And there's something I think to be said about like nerves in big stadiums for the first time, especially when you're going from double A uh, to the majors by surprise that, you know, maybe you are unsure, maybe your feet are more nervous. And so like the reads you think are, you're going to get eventually at some point will show up right now. Now it's a little bit too much. But yeah, I thought it was a novelty when he was brought up. Like, uh, we got three outfielders we're going to play. If we're going to call somebody up, we may as well call up somebody who is, if he's going to be a major leaguer, it's going to be because he's going to be a Terrence Gore type. And so let's just run him and have him play defense. And the defense hasn't been good. He got picked off in his first game, but the, you know, he's otherwise three for three in stolen base attempts. But yeah, it's the the White Sox aren't so good that they can run a specialist like this. You ha- really need like either three outfielders never replace, or four outfielders you like and 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 you platoon them in and and Ellis is number five. But with the White Sox being so uncertain in the outfield, like Ellis is just he's a dangerous presence for a manager who likes to oversub uh, young players mm-hmm. to protect them. And yeah, I, I don't get it. Let's go Tommy Pham and Andrew Benatendi. I need one of you guys to get healthy real quick because the Duke Ellis experience, I'm over it. I am over I, I it. I think Pham, just because Benatendi leads to his own frustrating ends. No, I, when he's yeah, I, I would be rooting for Pham to come back before Benatendi. Yep. But one of you two, somebody, please. I'm over the Duke Ellis experience. It was cute. It was fun. Now it's over. It needs to be a money ball situation. Can't play him because he's not on the team anymore, Pedro. <sighs> well, Pedro will have new players to work with as the Chicago White Sox, surprisingly, are making a call up for their next series against the Seattle Mariners. We'll talk about those roster moves and the next series for the Chicago White Sox and what else is happening around Major League Baseball after a quick word from our sponsors. This podcast episode is presented by GameTime, an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, as GameTime makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the GameTime app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, and views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, GameTime takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. The Chicago White Sox are heading out west, visiting Seattle and Arizona this week. If you decide to take a vacation, follow the team, use game time to grab some tickets. Last summer, I visited Seattle before our cruise up to Alaska. I bought our party tickets for the Mariners game off of game time and found a great deal in the right field bleachers. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use our promo code SOXMACHINE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and use our promo code SOXMACHINE for $20 off. Game time. Last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. Before history is written, it's played. Before it's frozen in time, it's fought one shift at a time. Before it's etched in silver, it's carved in ice. What happens next will last forever. The Stanley Cup Final on ABC and ESPN Plus begins Saturday. Welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. Prior to Sunday's game, the Chicago White Sox made a few roster moves. Obviously, the biggest one is that Shane Drohan was activated by the White Sox off the 60-day injured list, and then promptly designated for assignment. Uh, So he's in limbo right now, and we'll see if any other teams claim him on waivers. If he clears waivers, there's going to be a conversation between the Boston Red Sox and the Chicago White Sox because Shane Drohan was the White Sox Rule 5 pick this past winter meetings. But Nick Nestrini, who was able to keep the Red Sox to one run, but it was really sketchy for a while during that start, he had for a long period of time had more he thrown more balls and strikes in that performance. Nestrini was optioned back to triple A. And making his major league debut this upcoming week in Seattle is the headliner of the Dylan Cease trade, Drew Thorpe. So those are the moves the White Sox made prior to Sunday. 
And Jim, you were able to go to Knoxville, as you mentioned earlier, you saw La Russa. And while you are interviewing staff and players, you learned about the Thorpe trade or the Thorpe call up, I should say, on Sunday. So tell us, when did you find out and what do you make of the White Sox calling up Drew Thorpe to make his major league debut? Well, I yeah, had tip to uh, James Fox for being the first to uh, report uh, that he heard that Thorpe was coming up. I think he said expected. So there was like a slight hedge uh, or maybe just didn't want to uh, make it clear who was telling him. Uh, Cause it was funny. I was waiting for the Barons to clean up uh, or, or sorry, finish up a, uh, a bullpen side throwing session before the game. And you know, they're, they're putting equipment away and I'm waiting for John Eli to be done. Cause you know, he saw me and I was going to you know, check in with him a little bit. And right as that's happening, uh, Griffel announces it uh, to the media, uh, assembled media. So it's like, ah, yeah. It, but Eli didn't know it was um, uh, official at the time. So when I you know, asked him, he said, like, I'm, I'm not supposed to say. And like, well, Griffel just announced it. So now I know if I want to get a source in trouble uh, at some point, I can just say, yeah, Griffel announced it. And <laughs> he, he would take my word for it. Say, yeah, he's coming up and give me the uh, gushing quotes. And then, uh, you yeah. know it'd be kind of funny but yeah it was just the uh the probably 30 seconds before i was about to talk to him um you know it was confirmed but it was funny like day before he was throwing a bullpen session um as normal um on the side and i asked uh john i said just you know it's a case of where you knew it was happening and you're still keeping on schedule and like no we found out uh, this morning and uh you know so they, they kept it a secret from him too if they had a uh, you know real firm knowledge they're going to do it on saturday uh uh, he was not told about it. So it sounded like they were keeping him on schedule and then make the move when they have to make the move. But they're happy for him. Teammates are happy for him. Uh, Eli's happy for him. It's it's probably the most exciting move they can make that also gives the White Sox you know, an actual chance to win. Have you got a chance to watch Thorpe in person? Uh, yes. Uh, first series of the season I did. And you know, it was very impressive. Changeup is a real weapon. Among any pitch, I think, of any pitching prospect the White Sox have like that's probably the best major league weapon of any pitch both in terms of effectiveness when you see like him throwing it back to back sometimes three consecutive times he'll throw it to lefties he'll throw it to righties uh, very confident in doing so and a little bit like Lucas Giolito uh, when Giolito was at the height of his powers just the threat of the changeup I think makes the whole rest of his arsenal play up because the fastball is okay i think that's the biggest knock on him uh when you look at uh, prospect rankings or like keith law leaving thorpe out of his top 100 is just like he doesn't believe in the fastball being like that good or good enough to raise the rest of his arsenal to where like he's gonna be like more of a back-end guy than somebody who's like a number two starter perhaps uh but when at least yeah, against double A hitters, when the changeup's working, like the fastball is better, also the slider's better because he throws that with a lot of confidence as well. So you're looking at, I think, Nestrini, who has a problem of throwing strikes, going from him to Thorpe, who, at least based on his double A record uh, and how he performs there, uh, throws a lot of strikes and with a lot of pitches uh, to where if he gets beat, I think he'll be beat pretty quickly or at least he'll have some bad innings maybe give up a homer uh, because he's in the zone a lot uh, whereas Nestrini kind of uh, uh, sets himself up for just these slow mudslides of innings <laughs> that just uh, all of a sudden you look at the pitch count and be like oh god this is gonna be, gonna be a long day for the bullpen because he finally teetered over the edge uh, with how many guys he's walking and how few strikes he was throwing so it's gonna be a lot I think to ask of Thorpe to uh, be a credible major league starter start in and start outs but i think he's better equipped to do so than than Nestrini was than cannon right. just because cannon's problems with lefties uh yeah i think his arsenal still required more fine tuning i think thorpe his arsenal is more or less finished it's just a matter of doing it and i guess we'll find out if you know, triple A hitters have something to show him or if he has enough success to where like even if it is bumpy He's better off doing it in Chicago than he would be in Charlotte. Yeah, that seems to be the impression that James Fegan has been informing us, is that the new director of player development for the White Sox, Paul Yanish, I'm not going to say he doesn't like AAA, but maybe moving forward, 
the White Sox are going to be challenging their top prospects and sending them straight from double-A to Chicago. Like in the future, I'm not saying like in the near future this season, but maybe next year, if Noah Schultz is just dominating in Birmingham, he may just skip Charlotte. Like this may be the new trend for the Chicago White Sox because as we have spoken over many, 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 many years on this podcast, it is hard to trust any numbers because of the hitting environment in Charlotte and Baseball America just released their park factors and Charlotte is still one of the most friendly hitter ballparks in all of minor league baseball. So it's very tough to pitch there. So I get it. I I get calling up Drew Thorpe. Let's give him a challenge. And boy, what a challenge for Drew Thorpe. He's going to have this upcoming week as the Chicago White Sox have their West Coast road trip. So if you are a night owl, you are in luck because every White Sox game this upcoming week is going to be late, super late. As the Seattle Mariners are currently 37-30, and 30, their first place in the American League West, they have a five-game lead over the Texas Rangers. They won their last game against the Kansas City Royals. They had a crazy series against the Royals. The Mariners blew an 8 to nothing lead, uh, which the Royals came back and won that game 9-8. But the Mariners in their last 10 have won 6. They are a very good team at home. The Mariners are 21 and 11 at home. They're 16 and 19 away. And in one run games this season, Seattle is 14 and six. <laughs> Pedro Grafal's favorite one run games. Yeah. Pe- yeah. Grafal's favorite. Yeah. He sucks at that too. <laughs> Pitching problems for this series, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and Thursday. These are all 8 40 PM central time starts. Eric Fetty will get the ball for the White Sox on Monday against Logan Gilbert. Tuesday, Drew Thorpe makes his Major League debut. Brian Wu will make the start for the Mariners. Wednesday, coming off his three-inning save, which I love to see, Jonathan Cannon gets another shot to start against Bryce Miller. And Thursday night is a fantastic pitching matchup. Garrett Crochet against Luis Castillo. And for this series, obviously Tuesday night, circled on the calendar. Let's see how Drew Thorpe does at his Major League debut, Jim. But... A big question that I have, the White Sox are awful on the road this year. They only have five wins on the road. They're like five and 21 on the road. And again, Seattle's 21 and 11. On paper, Seattle should sweep against the White Sox. But I'm wondering, because we talked about how the White Sox offense has been performing better as of late. And here's a surprise. And shout out to our friend Beefloaf, because he's the one that mentioned it to me uh, during Sunday's game. We were watching it together. The White Sox have the third most home runs hit in the month of June right now. That's a surprise. Mm -hmm. And Seattle's pitching is fantastic. So, Jim, how do you think the White Sox offense will fare against Seattle's pitching? Not optimistic. Um, Although watching the uh, Royals storm back, uh, that was a fascinating game to watch uh, unfold online. Then I I tuned in later just because I've seen like, oh, this looks like it's actually happening. Uh, You know, they are susceptible to looking like anybody else. But the I've I've been looking forward to the series because the Mariners have been very frustrating to their fan base mostly because of their offense but when you're getting starting pitching like they've gotten like Brian Wu I think he'd been spent a little time hurts you know he's had flashes of being great but now he's been pretty much overpowering since he came back uh you know you got four starters the ERA is under four um it, it's really like it, a team that should be the kind that gets on a roll that should be you know on that level of you know, Yankees or Phillies in terms of just the quality starting pitching they're getting every time out and feeling like they should be you know, winning these games pretty handily, at least demoralizing teams with uh, the kind of run prevention they're able to do. And then you see their offense and it's been pretty much like a, uh, you know, middling like Jorge Polanco wasn't able to give them the boost. They thought, um, you know, Mitch Garver hasn't really been a, a, yeah, you know, the guy he was with the Rangers last year, so they're kind of uh, you know losing some, you know, or not, or not getting what they thought from big additions. Julio Rodriguez has been short of a star uh, this year, uh, and so I'm just looking forward to seeing them up close, uh, you know, for four days in a row, seeing like why is this not team not quite work? They're still good enough to lead the West, and I think that's what was making their fans nervous is when the Houston was down. 
uh, and, and the Rangers were going through their injuries and after kind of a quiet off season, uh, they're looking at the division saying, we should be running away with this. Like, you know, the, the Astros are a mess and still there's only like five, six games of separation. That doesn't feel like enough right. in case the Astros get all the way back or if the Rangers get Scherzer back and all of a sudden their rotation looks a lot stronger. So they've been frustrating and I'm looking forward to seeing like if that frustration carries over to facing the worst team in baseball, uh, kind of like we saw at the Red Sox. You know, sometimes you see it to where like the Cubs are able to win two close games and 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 feel better after playing the White Sox. We saw it, uh, you know, the opposite with the Cardinals, where the White Sox won a series and the Cardinals got mad and uh, started playing better. But the Mariners are one of those teams that just you know hasn't been able to quite get escape velocity from the rest of the division. And I'm curious if those characteristics uh, are even evident against a team that is playing as poorly as the White Sox have been until this you know most recent series. That's a good point, Jim, because this is a pretty big series for Seattle from their perspective, because with these four games against the White Sox, the Rangers are going to be at Los Angeles to face the Dodgers for three games. And the Houston Astros are going to be in San Francisco for a four game series. Those are two tough road series for Texas and Houston. So this is an opportunity for Seattle to even gain more ground against the Rangers and Astros to continue having that buffer. And offensively, that's kind of the area where I have some confidence here. Like, this might be a good matchup for Drew Thorpe because so many of the Mariners hitters are underperforming. I mean, Julio Rodriguez has got a 666 OPS this year. He's slugging just 348. He's already got 80 strikeouts this season. Mitch Hanniger is getting a lot of playing time for Seattle. He's got a 620 OPS. He's got the second most at-bats. Ty France has got a 732 OPS, and that's like one of the team leaders right now offensively for Seattle. I mean, we're talking about like Gavin Sheets, no joke, would have the best OPS on the Seattle Mariners if he was on their team. That's how underperforming the Mariners offense has been. So this could be really low scoring games in these four games the White Sox can get quality started pitching. I'm confident in Monday and confident in Thursday. I think Eric Fetty will have a good game. I think Garrett Crochet will have a good game. So maybe Seattle doesn't sweep, but that should be the expectation for the Manners against the White Sox because I said the White Sox were 5-21 on the road a moment ago. They're actually worse. They're 5-26 and on the road. But with so many close games, possibly even more one-run games, to come full circle, Jim. This is going to come down to some decision-making by Pedro Gafal. And can he press the right buttons to get this White Sox team to win more games? And if he can't, it's just going to be more evidence that he's way over his head. But you know what? Jerry Reinsdorf doesn't want any more dead money on the books, even though he's paying Lurie Garcia $5.5 million this season to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry doesn't want any more dead money. He doesn't want to pay another managerial salary, even though he's got Charlie Montoya currently on payroll. Who knows? Maybe he doesn't even know that Charlie Montoya is on his payroll. Luis Robert didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Yeah, I think uh, what's what's funny with um, uh, Nightingale's reporting is we never learn about the White Sox managerial uh, terms, uh, other contracts. Uh, they never release it. They always say like multi-year. They never talk about the terms. When it comes to players, they uh, specify everything about the deal. Uh, you know when you know what kind of buyouts are involved, what kind of clauses. Managers, uh, front office types are always like yeah, multi-year deal. Uh, we won't tell you when it's up, except when Nightingale reports it. Because uh, when Larusa's health was in question, um, Nightingale reported that he had one year left on his deal and was making four million dollars a year. So now we're learning that Griffol has one year left in his deal, but only making one million. So uh, when it comes to you know, the salary, it's not, uh, I guess, cheap just because that's typically what you know first-time managers make is around a million or so. It's like a pretty safe number to guess. Uh, some make less, uh, I've seen, like I've seen like 700, 800,000. Uh, some make more if they're in high demand, but that's kind of like a safe round number to use for estimations. But it is funny, like just how much they're paying La Russa, uh, and and how much uh, Reinsdorf didn't mind paying his friend. But when it comes to, uh, um, you know, 
you, know, you could pay Larusa four million dollars uh, when he's yeah been out of the game for ten years, but with Griffol paying him one million, you can't possibly pay like a little bit more for the remainder of the year. Like I assume that maybe like Charlie Montoyo might have some language in his contract to where like if he's managing, like he gets a pay bump, you know, just you, when you, when you assume duties are doing two jobs, uh, you do get a little bit more money. Uh, but even then, like not nearly enough to uh, match what they're paying their previous manager. And still that is more than uh, Reinsdorf is willing to pay. We'll see it how it's just priorities. It's not money. It's not like it's not cheapness. You know, it is a little bit, but I think it's just priorities. It's more laziness, I think, than being a miser. It's just I don't feel like doing it. it it's inefficient. Uh, I don't care enough. So you're going to be stuck with it. Well, that's the point. Like, I don't care enough. Great. If you don't care, then why should anyone else care? We got 90 more games left to go in this season. What a great salesman. What a great business guy. We'll see on how this series breaks down for the White Sox and the Mariners. Again, it'll be very late nights. Can't wait to watch these games with you guys all the way until well past 11 o'clock during work day. So I know how tough that will be. But that's what we are here for, you guys, at Sox Machine. We watch the White Sox so you don't have to. So if you fall asleep halfway through the game, don't worry. We got you covered. Go to SoxMachine.com. And we'll be recapping these games. And also this upcoming week, James did get a chance to sit down with Pedro Grafal. Uh, so that we have a one-on-one interview with Pedro Grafal that James will be writing up later this week on SoxMachine.com. Let's stop talking about the White Sox. Let's go around Major League Baseball here as we usually do for the Monday episodes every week. And the New York Mets and the Philadelphia Phillies played a series in London. It's nice to get baseball really early in the morning to get started, especially on Sunday when you got super regionals for college baseball. It's baseball around the clock. It's overdosing on Major League Baseball, Jim. And on social media, it appears, especially for the diehards in London, the UK accounts, like every team has a UK account. They're loving this. But for me, I totally spaced out. I totally forgot this London series was coming. Despite involving two big teams, despite involving the best team in the National League right now, the Philadelphia Phillies, like this idea of continuing to play games in London, Jim, does it make sense to continue doing this in London? To me, it makes sense everywhere else they've done it. Mexico City, Japan, South Korea, Dominican Republic, Cuba. Yeah, those make sense. But London... I'm still unsure. It feels a little bit like, you know, keeping up with the NFL. Like if they're doing it there, then why can't we do it as well? Like we're a major league. We can play these games over there. Um, But I, you know, I kind of like it. I I see no harm in doing it. Uh, Maybe it'd be fun if the, you know, just casting a little bit wider, you know, wider scope for the amount of locations, try to expand it more to the other world baseball classic countries that participates to increase participation and the uh the quality of the teams there so i think that's what makes sense like as long as the world baseball classic is a thing and it should continue being a thing i think it is incumbent on major league baseball to support those markets especially if you are seeing some growth if you are seeing some uh some footholds here and there like you know series in italy you know based on the quality of uh those teams not being you know uh, being surprisingly tough mm-hmm. in a uh, world baseball classic setting, like yeah, why not have uh, you know a series in Rome or something like that? Uh, you have some uh, players hit some balls in the Coliseum for stunts, like it's it's fun. Like you know, I think that's kind of the idea is harmless, and also like sometimes you get these uh, settings where you don't know what'll come of it. Uh, and if you see a little bit of a spark of baseball there, I think it is in their interest to fan the flames a little bit. If they don't, they know they don't have to do that in in, in Japan or uh, South Korea or Mexico or anywhere else. So like in these countries where there is like a little bit of a nascent stage of baseball, yeah, drop in, see what's going on. Uh, you reward the fans who are into it. Uh, like you, you mentioned with the UK accounts, like a lot of uh, fervent uh English baseball fans, as many as there are fervent American Premier League fans. Like, I think it's what the balance you want is uh, uh, you having uh, enough uh, Brits getting into baseball the way that Americans get into soccer over there. Uh, but I think anything to fan the flame, I think, is good, especially like when it, you know, the players don't seem to mind. The players seem to appreciate the new setting and, and uh, you know, 
how loud it can get. So yeah, keep going for it. But I don't mind like seeing, you know, Paris get involved. Uh, Amsterdam would be kind of cool. Paris, uh, I'm going to stop you there. Paris, no. The reason I'm pissed at Paris. Oh, you want to host a baseball game now, but you didn't want to build a baseball diamond and softball diamonds for the Olympics. No, screw you, Paris. That's how I feel right now. I'm kind of pissed that like Paris is like, hey, we'll we'll host a major league game. Oh really? Yeah. Oh really? <laughs> okay. Oh okay. All right, Paris. Everywhere else, yes. Not you, Paris. You're last. Okay. No, I can see that. Or at least you know, uh, putting them in timeout. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Amsterdam. <laughs> when was the last time Major League Baseball played in the Netherlands? Uh, I so I like the word honkball. I, I think uh, I just want. To, I know yeah. you love the word honkball, but. Yeah, it's just, I guess then it's on me. Like, maybe the onus is on me to be more aware. I mean, you are. You, maybe this is another opportunity that Major League Baseball just didn't promote it enough. And then it just like dawned on me, like, oh, they're playing games in London this week. I think it's part, you know, maybe it's part that, but also I think you are probably more invested in uh, the College World Series than most. So perhaps. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot going <laughs> So perhaps uh, your focus on the draft is, uh, you know, um, one where uh, you are on the higher end of the um, activity spectrum for college baseball. And so other f- brands of baseball uh, slipped under your radar. Maybe that's true. And you also had Dodgers at Yankees this weekend, which obviously garnered a lot of attention yeah. this weekend. Those games have been a lot of fun too. So if the White Sox played in London, I would try to go over to London and watch those games and try to organize some type of fan meetup because we do have a lot of fans in the UK. Yeah, I will say that the Dodgers and the Yankees felt a little bit weird for them to be playing at the same time because at first I thought that was the London series. It does. Like that feels very much like an international series. Like we're bring, yeah, we're bringing our top selling caps. Uh, the, the cap, yeah, I think it's Dodgers, Yankees, and White Sox are the three top selling caps internationally, just because of what they are as a uh, fashion streetwear item. Um, and and so having those uh, teams playing in London, even if it is a hall for the uh, Dodgers, uh, makes a lot of sense. So, to, you know, at first I thought like, oh, they're playing. They must be the London series. Then, oh, yeah, it's Phillies and somebody else because the Mets are sadly irrelevant or maybe hilariously irrelevant based on your feelings of the Mets and uh, their tendencies to trip over themselves. But, uh, yeah, the Phillies are the kind of marquee team you think of when thinking about an international uh, setting. Mets, not so much, but it is an easier trip for them than than other teams. Sure. Have they announced what next year's London series is? Haven't seen it myself, which isn't to say that they have announced it. Yeah. Well, the Rickwood Classic, I'm... I'm definitely interested in. Uh, as soon as I Google it, the long-term future of baseball in London's under some doubt. There's no current series scheduled for London in 2025. There is an agreement for baseball to return to London in 2026, but there are no plans past 2026. And Bryce Harper talked about that. He spoke with Talk Sport, which is obviously a big sports website. In the UK, uh, and Harper loves it. He urges Major League Baseball to continue playing in London. So, convert those soccer stadiums to baseball fields. Uh, or maybe London should just build a baseball stadium if they have more Harry Fords coming up to help them in the World Baseball Classic. Also, the All-Star voting has begun, so you can vote for the All-Star game. There is a hilarious campaign to try to vote Martin Maldonado into the All-Star game, so if you would like to have your joke votes counted for, you could do so as uh, you can start voting for the All-Star game. So those were my two big items around Major League Baseball. Jim, what is catching your attention around the league? Hashtag vote Maldi. Um, Probably Aaron Judge. Uh, just slugging over 700. Stupid. Always, yeah, it's <laughs> always cool. Like he and like there, there are a few hitters, him and Shohei Otani. Um, just, they, I think like they activate the primitive part of my brain when they connect. Uh, Giancarlo Stanton, another one where it's just destruction. And I just think, oh, that's cool. <laughs> like, when you see him get a hold of one. And so like, I've always thought baseball is... Uh, yeah, baseball is more exciting when Otani is you know, doing what he's doing, but also judges on that tier of just non-baseball fans take notice of just how uh, vicious and um, impressive 
the velocities and distances are off the bat like they it, it really is um yeah it, it stands out even among like you know NBA, NFL, just of, of the sheer athleticism you see on display and the strength you see on display in those sports. Like, I think that's the, the cleanest, most direct translation to baseball is when Judge gets a hold of one. So that's, uh, it's cool to see him healthy. Uh, yeah, some people might say he's on the Yankees and like, you know, are kind of averse to anything Yankees, but I think Judge transcends that to me of just being like, it's cool when he's able to maximize his entire uh skill set playing center field also like playing a credible center field um it's incredible what he's doing right now so it's very awesome i think as a baseball fan to watch him do what he does who do you think is the mvp between aaron judge and juan soto for that yankees team i think judge just because of him playing center okay yeah judge right now is on pace to hit 58 homers and 51 doubles I'm looking at his uh, wins above replacement right now just to see what kind of... I mean, the fact... Is he at double digits yeah, the, the, for uh, projection? Let me see. Yeah, the, the fact that the Yankees have Judge and Soto, and it's working out as well as it has. Working out maybe better than Otani to the Dodgers, but then again, Otani's starting to throw, and he plans on pitching next year. But man, that Yankees yeah. team... Judge's already at 4.7 wins above replacement. We don't, I'm not even going to bother asking that question. No, no White Sox player <laughs> is going to reach 4.7 war in 2024. But yeah, Judge currently leads the league with 24 homers. Gunnar Henderson continues his surprise. He's got 20 homers. He's second. Kyle Tucker just got injured. He's on the injured list now for the Astros, but he's third with 19. And uh, Jose Ramirez doing Ramirez things. He's got 18 homers and 62 RBIs. But yeah, I think for the American League MVP vote, right now it's like it's between judge and soto and i think that's going to dominate a lot of the national talk is what's going on in new york like it's going to be a lot of east coast talk during the summer with philadelphia and atlanta and the yankees in baltimore because despite on how well the yankees have been playing the orioles are not fading they're still in the coattails of the yankees and then you have what the dodgers are doing out west yeah, no, I think that's fair right now just because when you look at the AL West and NL West, like only two teams are over 500 between those two divisions. Yeah. I mean, there's only one, two, three, four. Only four teams in the National League have a record above 500. Six playoff teams, remember. Only four teams <laughs> have a record better than 500 in the National League. Put into perspective, the Chicago Cubs, if the season were to end today, would be in like this four-way tie for the sixth seed. They are just they're, so they're tied for second place right now with the Reds and Cardinals. They are only a half game ahead of the Pirates. So the next time we have a podcast episode, it could be a possibility that both Chicago teams are in last place of their respective divisions. And while that was somewhat expected for the White Sox, very unexpected. For the Chicago Cubs. That's how tight it is right now in the National League Central between second place and fifth place. And it might be that way for the entire season when it comes to the ball card race. And that is what will make the National League Central interesting, Jim, is those fifth and sixth seats. Which teams can reach 83 wins? <laughs> yeah, it's just you get a point where, you know, this is what I didn't like about the expanded postseason is just rewarding mediocrity like this. And also... When you have so many teams that are theoretically in it, and looking at the uh, wild card race, uh, you have the Reds, Giants uh, are tied with the Cubs right now. Then you have the Cardinals, Pirates, Diamondbacks, and Nationals within one and a half games. Even the Mets are only three back of the last yeah. wild card spot. And how many of those teams are going to be trying? How many of those teams are going to be selling at the deadline? Like it's, I, I think it, it does lead to just inaction because when it comes to like the deadline, like who's going to step on it for like a chance to like get the sixth spot in the National League? Um, and, you know, we'll look foolish uh, given how risk averse a lot of GMs are like going for it but also like selling would look stupid so i think you'll get a lot of these small moves on the margins that don't really 
you know, kind of like the Rick Hahn thing of just like, you'll get a lot of Jake Diekman trades, just trying to round out and look for any kind of marginal edge, but nobody wants to commit to being better than they are than worse than they are. So that's what I'm, I'm thinking might sap some of the uh, excitement out of the trade deadline, which I mean, could make the White Sox more important to teams, but probably not if uh, Crochet and uh, yeah, maybe Eric Fetty is the one that just has the clearest case of how he should be valued and everybody else is going to be more about uh, brinksmanship to try to get prices uh, raised or lowered. It'd be funny if Eric Fetty is the biggest name that gets traded by all teams in Major League Baseball before the deadline. That would be kind of funny to me. Pretty boring. We'll see what happens. We're, we're a little bit more than a month out for the trade deadline, but we could see some activity pick up here, especially if any teams want to separate themselves. The Cincinnati Reds are hot again. They've won eight of their last 10 games. They've thrown themselves back into this race. So the National League is just going to be, if you love chaos, the National League wild card is there for you. And it will be chaotic all summer long. Well, that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening. You can subscribe to the Sox Machine Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. You can also listen to the show at our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Sox Machine. Thank you for those that have been doing that. And also thank you to all the new subscribers that we have on YouTube. So thank you very much for doing that. You can also follow us on social media. We're at Sox Machine and all the social media platforms. You can follow James at J.R. Fegan and you can follow me at Sox Machine underscore Josh. You can help support Sox Machine and gain full access to all of our White Sox coverage by signing up at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. Monthly plans start at $5 and that gets you ad free versions of both the website and the podcast. And again, all of our access to the Chicago White Sox coverage, especially from our beat reporter, James Vegan. And thanks to your Patreon support, we'll be able to send James out to Arizona next weekend as he'll not only cover the Diamondback series, but James will stop by the complex for the Chicago White Sox to check out and see how the Arizona Complex League is going for the White Sox. And that's a huge thanks to our Patreon supporters that make that happen. Again, if you love the way that we cover the Chicago White Sox because we watch the White Sox so you don't have to, Please support us at patreon.com slash Sox Machine. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all the things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Alongside Jim Margulis, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.